PCOS stands for polycystic, that's the P and the C, ovarian, that's the O, syndrome, that's the S. And so it affects somewhere upwards of 10%, maybe as much of a quarter of women. And like you said, it's the leading cause of ovulatory infertility. And it's actually something that's pretty complex and it's not totally known where it comes from, um, but it seems to be a multigenic disorder, have a lot of epigenetic contributors, um, maybe have something to do with in utero testosterone exposure. And then on the slightly brighter side, it also has a lot to do with lifestyle and diet. So there are a lot of things that people can do um, to impact it and make it better. How does PCOS typically manifest in the body? How might someone notice or realize that they might have PCOS? So unfortunately, it can be really uh, hard to diagnose PCOS, and it often takes a long time. But there are some pretty clear signs. Uh, It has to do with fundamental hormone imbalances and often the excess production of androgens. So these are hormones that we typically associate with male reproduction, Mm -hmm. even though women have them too, like testosterone. So one of the common hallmarks of PCOS will be excess production of testosterone. It also commonly presents as symptoms of menstrual irregularity. So that will be things like absence of menstrual periods or very long cycles, things like more than 35 days long or evidence of missed ovulation in people who might track something like their LH or luteinizing hormone. Um, They might see that they're going a long period between menses and not seeming to have any ovulation at all. And then there are some secondary symptoms to excess levels of androgens, and those are things like excess hair growth, um, also called hirsutism. And then finally, given the name, the last bucket um, of symptoms is cysts on the ovaries. And then uh, to connect that to metabolic health, it's also really common to have insulin resistance in PCOS, and the majority of women with PCOS are obese. So not surprisingly, uh, this is actually a really big umbrella category um, syndrome that might comprise several um, unique subtypes. Interesting. Azure, you mentioned that typically it takes a while to diagnose PCOS. Is it something that typically manifests in women after they have hit puberty and begin menstruating, or can you diagnose it in younger women? So really interesting question. Most people are diagnosed with PCOS in adulthood, um, but because the three criteria for PCOS diagnosis are a little bit different from each other, and because you only have to meet two of them for a diagnosis, it is possible to get one quite early. So those three criteria are evidence of too much androgens for a female. And so those are the things that uh, like high testosterone that can lead to excess hair growth. Ovulatory dysfunction is one of them. So obviously if if a person is not yet having menstrual cycles, um, they're not going to be able to to demonstrate ovulatory dysfunction. And then the third one is the presence of cysts on an ovary, um, which, you know, you have ovaries your whole life. So Theoretically, and this does happen sometimes in the premenarchical stage, um, girls as young as 10 have been diagnosed with both too much androgen production and cysts on the ovaries. However, the the point that you bring up about time to diagnosis in PCOS, um, the average length of time it takes to diagnose PCOS is two years and three doctors and often more than that. So it takes a really long time. Is there any... uh negative impact of delayed diagnoses, or does it not really progress from the time you begin to show symptoms of PCOS? Right. Good question. So there are a lot of impacts of delayed diagnosis, and I I think the first ones are probably under diagnosis. So at the beginning, we gave this big range of probably at least 10% of women I think one of the recent figures was 13% of women 18 to 49 have received a a PCOS diagnosis um, already, but maybe up to a quarter, meaning that a lot of people are falling off the wagon and not getting diagnosed. And um, yeah, it's it's a lot. And to understand what that happens, I mean, think about going to the doctor in the US and you need to prove that you have two of the following, too much testosterone or, uh, or body hair growth, 
ovulatory dysfunction, meaning you need to have shown that you're not ovulating. You need to have maybe tracked your cycles for months to show that they're long or unstable. Um, And although more and more women are tracking their cycles, many still don't. So that takes time. And then uh, determining whether or not you have polycystic ovaries requires going in for an ultrasound. So at this point, you're looking at blood work, you're looking at potentially multiple months of self-tracking, different providers, different appointments. And for a lot of Americans, especially, that means a lot of time to try to get in to see these different people and a lot of expense. And without a lot of background or maybe a lot of felt frustration about what is this problem that I'm having um, and why can't they figure it out faster, you can imagine a lot of people might, um, might stop somewhere along the way. That makes a ton of sense. Sounds like an uphill battle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And as you suggested, these seem to have really bad downhill consequences, meaning the longer that someone goes living with PCOS that is diagnosed, um, the more likely they are to uh, either have more trouble with fertility and also to go on to develop things like type 2 diabetes. So it's something like you're 7x more likely to develop type 2 diabetes um, if you have PCOS. Wow. So tugging on the metabolic health thread there, the type 2 diabetes, can you talk a bit more about the insulin resistance um, or lack of insulin resistance for women with PCOS? How are metabolic health and PCOS related? Insulin resistance or having too high insulin seems to be very common in PCOS. So it's up to 70% of women who are diagnosed also demonstrate insulin resistance on something like an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, And more than half of those women, so not only do they have insulin resistance, but more than half go on to develop type 2 diabetes by a pretty young age, by about 40. So um, it's also thought maybe that when people come in initially and and they receive a a type 2 diabetes diagnosis, they can then go on to get Mm -hmm. a, a PCOS diagnosis. So how are these related? It's still something that is actively being studied, and it seems like it's a combination of in utero uh, and genetic factors, so things you can't control that already happened that um, make an individual more likely to be insulin resistant. But there's also this kind of vicious cycle of having high insulin leads to increased appetite, um, can lead to more carb cravings and cravings for other sweet foods, um, which can perpetuate the problem of higher glucose, higher insulin. In addition, having high insulin can impair fatty acid oxidation or or fat burning um, in the mitochondria, which can make it even harder to lose weight. And then there's a a really interesting interaction between um, cells in the ovaries and insulin receptors themselves. So in the ovaries, uh, insulin receptors are found on these things called theca cells. And those cells, when they make androgen, um, which is, which is higher in PCOS, um, can get more insulin receptors. And moreover, insulin can increase the number of theca cells that a person has. And we can go on and on. So having high insulin can lower the production of something called sex hormone binding globulin, um, something that would normally bind testosterone and help take it out of circulation. So obviously, if you have less of that, you're going to have even more testosterone around. And on top of that, uh, the elevated androgen levels themselves can contribute to more fat deposition in women. So it's really, unfortunately, a process that if it doesn't get interrupted by something like um, a lifestyle intervention or first thing first, a diagnosis, then it can get worse and worse over time. From the perspective of a lifestyle intervention, can you talk a bit about any research that's been done around monitoring things like your glucose levels um, to manage PCOS? Any, Any specific research that's been done in that space? Absolutely. So I think this is something that is a a really positive takeaway with PCOS is that a lot of different diets have been studied with respect to PCOS. So one of the first things that that doctors want to do with these patients is to help them get some weight down if they're overweight, which most of these patients tend to be. And uh, any number of dietary interventions that you might expect, including Mediterranean diet, the hypertension diet, 
old fashioned caloric restriction, um, supplementation, mm-hmm. including with things like CoQ10, uh, all of these things seem to help PCOS. So anything that is going to uh, result in a in a pretty big drop of weight or to help initially lower blood glucose levels, um, if done consistently over time, really seems to help with PCOS. Got it. So mm-hmm. mostly you just talked on uh, dietary uh, changes, any lifestyle changes that have been studied that have made a positive impact on managing PCOS? Yeah, I would say um, food seems to be the one that it's studied really consistently, but exercise like you might expect uh, leading to weight loss um, and in particular things like uh, endurance exercise habits um, can be really good for getting that waist to hip ratio down and improving insulin sensitivity. Um, one other thing that I want to mention is that uh, it doesn't seem to be just the impact of things like restricting carbs or restricting calories, but one of the things we talk about a lot of levels is the importance of things like phytonutrients in having an overall healthy diet. Phytonutrients are little particles and molecules found in plants, and these help our metabolism work more efficiently. They give ourselves things that they need to do to um, to help burn fat more efficiently. Uh, it's like a, a big and growing field of, of research because often um, old fashioned diets were designed to focus on the, the three main macronutrients uh, and their ratios of consumption. But as you might expect, uh, especially plant rich foods and, and naturally occurring foods are filled with all kinds of vitamins, minerals, enzymes, um, active compounds that, that have a lot to do with helping us have a healthy metabolism. Got it. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, You mentioned restricting calories. Has there been any research around the impact of fasting on managing PCOS? Yes. uh, Time-restricted eating is something that does seem to be really helpful for for weight loss generally, um, but also for weight loss in in PCOS. So time-restricted eating, or it's also called um, intermittent Mm -hmm. fasting, is, is a related set of practices. But this means, A, eating your food during the daytime, and B, setting your food hours to a certain number of hours during the day. So the minimum that seems to kick in, kick in for benefits is 12 hours, which most people can pull off. Um, but if people can work up to it, something more like 13, 14 hours uh, of fasting per day uh, can have really good benefits. And, and this has to do in part with the biological rhythms we have in our body, including in our glucose and insulin sensitivity. Sensitivity. So people tend to be more insulin sensitive during the earlier hours in the day. So think especially mid-morning to early to mid-afternoon, and then to be a little bit more reactive later at night. So a lot of these diets focus on shifting the eating window so that you're not having that late night dessert. Maybe you're having a little bit of an earlier dinner and a slightly later breakfast, or some people omit breakfast altogether. So it does seem to be very effective. It can be hard for people to mm-hmm. jump into cold turkey and um, and get rid of a lot of you know habits that they love, but it is something that can be worked up to over time for um, for good effects and allow people to maintain a little bit more of the typical content of what they were eating and just change the timing. The good news here is that it sounds like there's a number of different ways that you can manage PCOS from a dietary uh, perspective. You can try keto. You can try fasting, um, calorie restricting, all these different ways. So the, the good news is that is it sounds like it's not a one size fits all solution. Yeah. And one thing that we didn't talk about as much, um, but bears mentioning is that birth control and metformin, which is a diabetes drug, mm-hmm. are also pretty common frontline treatments um, to treat PCOS. Um, and I'm not the clinical useful kind of doctor. So I'm, you know, less, um, less good for, for commenting on those, but they, but they do help a lot, especially in the beginning to help restore insulin sensitivity and to help break the cycle of, of excess androgen production. Um, but I think, uh, personally and, uh, and we often tend to advocate, there's a lot that you can do, um, non-pharmaceutically to either supplement the, the medication that's prescribed mm-hmm. or to, um, you know, break the, break the cycle in PCOS, um, just through the foods that you choose to eat and through more exercise. 
from the role that you sit in. So there's a lot of different experiments that women with PCOS can experiment with. If you could wave a magic wand, what are one to two studies that you would love to work on to better understand PCOS as it relates to metabolic health? Ah, okay. Super fun question. I love it. So studies that I would love to work on to understand how PCOS and um, metabolic health are related. Uh, Well, the first one is really simple, and it's getting a lot more CGMs on women with PCOS, and then taking that CGM data that's collected every five to every 15 minutes and looking at all of the nitty-gritty, complex, fun features like the size of the spikes after meals or the shape of the spikes after meals. Are they pointy or are they curvy? when they happen, how often people eat, all of that really detailed data so that we're not just looking at something like what was your mean glucose over the day or what was your response over two hours to a single oral glucose tolerance test. So I think there's a lot of basic work to do in characterizing the glucose phenotypes in women with PCOS. Separate from that, um, it seems pretty clear that there are subgroups of people with PCOS who might have pretty different disorders from one another. So imagine someone who does or doesn't uh, present with cysts um, or someone who does or doesn't present with excess androgen production. Both of these people could still fall under the same diagnosis and might typically clinically get, um, get similar feedback. But really, if you're a person who has high testosterone as a woman and a person who doesn't, you have very different things metabolically going on. Similarly, um, some people with PCOS aren't overweight. That's probably a a different phenotype and and maybe needs a different set of of treatments in it and advice than someone who is overweight. So I think the the top couple of studies that I would want to do are uh, a general population characteristic of of what the the subtypes of Mm -hmm. PCOS are with some continuous data to back that up. And then a deep dive on what are the features of the the shapes and the the timing um, of glucose excursion in PCOS and and how those correlate with things like symptom severity or um, improvement over time if someone goes on a particular diet. So I think the, the common theme among those is I think we have a lot of time series data now that is easier for people to acquire than it was in the past. And, and it's really on us to make the most of every single minute that's in that data set.